Hello and welcome to the Health Creation Alliance annual members meeting. I'm Durka or Durga Dougal, and I'm delighted to be opening the meeting as the new chair of the Health Creation Alliance. The health and care system has been on such a tremendous journey, both in terms of progress, but also at a point where right now it's facing considerable challenges too. From workforce to finance and much in between, there is so much that is possible and needed to help transform the future of health and care. I believe that the principles of health creation can really spell a fundamental change in what's needed to bring about that healthier future. And I believe that the work of the Health Creation Alliance has already helped to start turning that into action. It's such an opportune moment, therefore, to really take stock today at our meeting and look back on all the work and progress that has been made at the Health Creation Alliance, and then to work together during this meeting to really look forwards and think how we together as board members, as newcomers, as experienced individuals, as members, as partners, as allies, can really unlock the potential of the health and care system to transform its thinking towards a much more health creating approach and really transform the lives of the people that it serves. Thank you for joining us today. Um, hello everybody. So I've been asked to uh, just do a quick summary of what's happened over the last year and such a huge amount. Um, so we're, we're starting off with the Fuller and the Hewitt reports. There have been so many reports over the last year, but we're particularly focused on those two uh, very high level national reports that focus on uh, the need for integrated care partnerships uh, to evolve, to be more effective, and very much a focus on prevention. And of course, the most significant uh, prevention methodology we can use is that of health creation and enabling the individual to flourish. So the reports have focused on the need for greater engagement and partnerships with out of hospital partners, with system partners, and most importantly, with people. Both reports focus heavily on that and both reports um, call for a much greater focus on prevention. I'm sure all of us are cited on the cost of living crisis, uh, but there have been some very hard hitting reports from the Trussell Trust, from the RSA, from the Joseph Rowntree Foundation, and uh, from the new local organization. Um, all of those organizations we work with and some very powerful uh, reports and commentary from them. I've been asked to talk about the strain that the NHS is under. A third of our newly qualified medical staff are leaving the UK to go and work abroad when we are short of medical staff anyway. The nurses, as you know, are on strike and the junior medics are going to go on strike again. And the consultants are progressing their industrial action um, um, conversations. Waiting lists are increasing. Uh, GPs are unable to meet demand despite working flat out and many GPs are leaving utterly exhausted and uh, colleagues may be aware of the announcement last week of uh, pharmacists uh, now prescribing a limited range of medication, uh, but the pharmacists have limited capacity as well. And uh, uh, just to remind people that the NHS is absolutely dependent on social care. Um, for its survival. So we're in a very highly strained context. Could I have the next slide, please, Neil? So there has been a marked increase in health inequalities. The gap between rich and poor grows ever greater. The ONS is reporting excess deaths. People are dying who should not be. The Marmot Review, Sir Michael Marmot, um, continues to campaign tirelessly on this topic. He has set up the Institute of Health Equity, uh, the Health Foundation and the Royal College of Nursing and the British Geriatric Society have published again powerful reports on this topic. So against all this backdrop, 
uh, there has been an increased interest in health creation. As you know, the Health Creation Alliance has been around for a number of years, and there is now increasing recognition of its importance. So uh, the top department in the NHS in some of its publications, the Institute for Global Change, the Royal Society of Medicine, the New Local Government Network, uh, Lord Nigel Crisp and Salas, all have messaged uh, very strongly about the need for health creation, or sometimes it's called creating health. Next slide, please, Dale. Um, so clearly we had a very significant year. The Many of us mourned the death of Queen Elizabeth II, and many of us recently celebrated the coronation of King Charles III. It will be a new era, both in terms of um, our history as a nation, but also in terms of the very different personal styles of the two individuals. We need to move on from the post-war British institutional models, the NHS being a very uh, marked example of that. We need to move on from those models to better meet the needs of our people in the 21st century. At the coronation concert, Stella McCartney described the, the new king as a champion for hope and action, and anyone who has worked with him would say that that is a very true statement. The Prince's Trust has already supported a million young people and aims to support three million um, in addressing inequality with wraparound support. And that support takes the, the form of uh, improving confidence and contacts. King Charles III is, has always campaigned and spoken with passion about the environment and sustainability. And there is increasing recognition of the role of nature, clean air, clean water, and good soil to all our health. This year marks the 75th anniversary of the establishment of the NHS, something to both celebrate and be proud of. It is also the 75th anniversary of the creation of social care, that safety net for the most vulnerable in society. So I hope I haven't depressed you all too much. So I wanted to remind you of some positive messages, including the lessons learned from COVID. We saw huge mutual aid. We saw families and neighborhoods supporting people in a way that we previously were not aware of. We saw the role of our faith organizations and our charities at a time of immense national need. We saw so many kind people. We were reminded of the social capital within our communities and across the land. We have many, many good people. We saw that it is possible to overcome red tape. Could I have the next slide, please, Neil? And so finally, just to remind colleagues that we should never doubt that a small group of thoughtful, committed citizens can change the world. And that group of thoughtful, committed citizens is on that call today. Thank you, Neil. I'd like to pass on to Neil now, who's going to talk about the key achievements of the Alliance over the last year. Thank you very, thank you very much, um, Lynn. <clears throat> and let me just do the, one second, get the... Okay, so I'm just going to look, just uh, two slides, just to very quickly look at um, an overview of our key achievements in terms of some of the organi organizational um, activities, and then just some of the key achievements in terms of some of the projects that we've been delivering. Delivering. So if we look at the first one is um, within the business plan, we had a very um, ambitious revenue target of well over a quarter of a million. And we actually um, delivered about 85% 85 85 of that. So um, we are very pleased with that. Um, obviously quite challenging times and we did have a real stretch target. So um, it puts us in a very good place as we're moving forward. In terms of our membership, absolutely important. We had a target of increasing our membership by about 10%, but in fact, we have increased our membership by 20% to just under 1,800 
um, members that are we um, capture within that are subscribed to the organization. So that's good. And this year you'll see, and as part of this meeting today, is that we're going to have a continual focus on working and leveling change with the membership. So we um, will be setting ourselves a stretch target for this year. In terms of engagement, which is very important, so it's all very important having, uh, you know, having a, a membership. But if we're not actually engaged, being a members' organisation, um, if we're not engaged with our membership and we're not working and supporting our membership and our membership supporting us achieve our mission, then we're not um, achieving our overall um, purpose. But actually, our engagement of our membership is about fifty-four percent. So engagement means is people who regularly um, maintain contact or open our emails or click through on events etc than when, when we send details out so this is actually measured through MailChimp so our engagement is at 54 percent that's up seven percent over the last 12 months we have wow. moderate engagement with 10 percent and then in fact there's we have very limited engagement which is they're not responsive to our communication emails outreach etc with 23 percent so um i think one of our key focuses as we're going forward will be moving people that we have moderate engagement with to the higher engagement and addressing why we're not engaging with some of the the others because 24 percent is about 400 um uh, subscribed members so that gives you a little bit over um our achievements financially in our membership and in terms of um project wise so i think it's <laughs> In terms of project rise, I just wanted to actually really just focus in on three. Um, the first one is a number of um, reports that we've produced over the last year, the most recent one being creating spaces for community and patient well-being, which we delivered in partnership with NHS Property Services. And pleased to say this is our dissemination. They've done their own dissemination. So this would add to the figures. I mean, the reports, and in fact, all of the reports were directly disseminated to over 2,000 people. And the opportunities to see that the reports were available, that's where the um, King's Fund, through their bulletin, has raised awareness that the reports are available. And they've actually featured each of the three reports within one of their monthly bulletins. So that's there's great opportunities for people to see that the report's are there. And actually, from our website alone, we've had over four, 400 downloads of those reports. So um, wow. it seems that it's important creating the reports, but also we're getting traction in terms of um, disseminating them to inform opinion. Melon's going to talk a little bit more about Surrey, but we um, secured a significant project which we've been delivering um, in Surrey around health creation to reduce um, health inequalities. It's a discovery learning program, and we've engaged with over 260 participants across half of the PCNs in the um, in the Surrey area. So again, that program is um, almost coming to an end, but that was a real achievement in terms of um, securing a significant project. And of course, we, we've heard a lot about coming of age and actually coming of age when now the organization is coming of age and it's a platform we're continuing to use. But here's just some of the metrics um, from then. There were seven sessions, seven chairs, 38 speakers, 15 panel member, members with a contribution <laughs> from 12 people with lived experience. So no mean feat managing all of those. We had 3,500 people visited the event page, of which 1,000 registered an interest, and overall 500 people attended one or more of the individual events. And we secured some media outreach, a number of features with National Health Executive and Public Health Executive. And so therefore, that given their readership, there's a, what we call one2 2 million media opportunities to see. So that's people to, opportunities of people to see the key messages coming out of coming of age. We have five rich content videos, which are available on our website, which capture the key outcomes from each of the individual sessions. And so far to date, um, there's over 215 views of that. And very importantly, and something that Meryn will be coming on to later, um, we listen to our members and we have 16 calls to action, which we're further developing um, based on people's contribution to those meetings. So all in all, um, there's a lot more that we've achieved this year, but I hope that just gives you a bit of insight into how we are continuing to address some of the challenges um, that Lynn raised. So. That's um, me, so I will now hand over to Donna. So let me just find you, Donna. Thank you, Neil. Okay. So um, good afternoon, everyone. My name's Donna McLaughlin, and I'm speaking to you from a slightly dull Manchester. It did start off sunny, but I don't know why it's gone. So if anyone's got it where they are, please send it back. 
Um, so in this section, what I want to do is outline the key changes for health creation over the last year. Um, and I guess just to start off with, a, a firstly, a, a personal thank you for having me. So I joined the board about a year ago at what was a really uh, exciting time. Um, and can I extend uh, my welcome to, our, to Dirk as our new chair? I guess as, just to pick up on the theme that, that Neil spoke about, about coming of age. So as, as colleagues on the call who have been on this journey longer than I will, will be aware of, that the health creation has been leading this national movement to address health inequalities. And I guess we could describe that story as for the beginning of, um, of, of the health creation. It, things moved slowly and in the right direction, but COVID as a destructive change changed everything. And it exposed the stark inequalities at the same time, making visible some of those more hidden aspects of how communities work, become resilient and thrive. It concentrated minds on how inequalities leads to poor health outcomes, but also on how to address in, in how to address inequalities can be addressed by creating the conditions for communities to become stronger through connections. Again, picking up a theme that uh, that Lynn raised at the beginning. So the last three years have been quite different. And um, as Neil spoke about, we've uh, created this uh, coming of age as a kind of metamorphosis, as a in terms of how we're maturing as an organisation. Um, and really to, to ensure that it becomes much more um, business as usual. So there was the public uh, change and celebration that Neil spoke about through the coming of age um, series of events accumulating with the House of Lords reception. And it's, it's lovely to see some faces, uh, virtual faces that I met in person at that event. But we also, um, uh, there was secondly some internal coming of ages in terms of to improve our governance and effectiveness as a board. So our chair, Brian, and I, as the newest member of the board, undertook a board review where we looked at roles and responsibilities as we mature as a board. And I guess before I hand over to my next colleague, just to put on record my thanks to Brian, who has been instrumental in driving health creation forward in helping me to settle in. And we're delighted that he's continuing as a board member. I'd also like to express my thanks to fellow board members and to our incredible um, Chief Executive Marion. So back over to you, Neil. Okay, thank, thank you very much. Um, and our next contributor from the board, and um, thank you for that, um, Don. Our next contribution from the board is Peter, who's going to be looking at um, some of the finances for us. Okay, well, welcome. Uh, and good to share with you where we're at financially. Really, the finance is just the plan for the organization expressed in money. Um, if you want to see the full accounts, you're more than welcome to a copy. Uh, and to look through those, um, but I thought it would be better to pick out the highlights. As I've said, really it's a plan for us, and as Neil's slide showed, our plan was to continue to grow the organisation, um, and we've succeeded in doing that by doing what we do well, um, and that's really by our focus on the health creation, the three C's of control, confidence, um, and the three C's, um, and then the bit about, I think, being a multidisciplinary network, and also, very importantly, the, pro the preference we give in work to, to lived experience. Those have continued to see the organization grow. We've been able to take on more associates and, and secure associates at our core. We don't have headquarters or a really yet permanent core, and that would be our next step. But we're going to get there by growing and continuing uh, to expand our influence. So we'd really like to take forward what we do by getting in much more around the new integrated care systems. You can see the beginnings of that approach uh, in some of what we've done, not least amongst Surrey. And our target really is to get into five or six integrated care systems and help with that from yourselves uh, would be really welcome. We are, of course, a community interest company. Uh, we are fully registered in the UK. All our associates and us an organisation are tax based here in the UK. Um, we put a lot into our pro bono work and support, including people with lived experience. And we want to continue to get that. Um, obviously, the more work we can land, the more we can rebalance that, uh, that equation. Um, so those are kind of the key messages and help with taking forward the health creation stuff. Uh, will it, of course, grow our accounts even better? Um, so please do let us know any leads you've got. And with that, I think it's over to Brian. Fantastic. Thank you, everybody. And very nice, nice to see everybody here. Um, I hope my sound works mm -hmm. for this meeting. Sometimes it doesn't. Uh, let me know if it doesn't. But um, I'm, I'm really pleased and proud to have been chair through a time of expansion and consolidation. 
We've collaborated with other organizations. We've self-funded with the important work that we do. We've listened to communities, worked with many sectors, always learning as we go. We've helped individuals, places, and larger areas develop along a health-creating route. Uh, the Alliance has been working with government and NHS England to show how they can create health and help tackle health inequalities. The beginning work with political parties to influence their future policy. We have made a really positive impact across the system, as Lynn has said. National guidance has reflected our ideas. Health creation is now a key concept across the system. Our ideas have helped shape national approaches to public health. Versions of health creation are developing in many different places. PCNs and ICSs see that they need to work with communities to get their agendas implemented. And to do that, they need to implement the agendas of local communities too. We can see how communities and individuals glow and flourish through the work that we do. So Alliance is recognized as leading in curating the evidence for health creation, and that's helped convince the system to begin to change. Um, our coming of age event was very successful, um, setting us up for the future. So thank you all um, to those who supported me and helped us all achieve. Meron, of course, the rock of the Alliance and the team that does the work, Neil, Lee, Rabina, our directors, an amazing group of people whom you've seen just now, wise, insightful, and relentlessly practical and optimistic. Our patron, Lord Adebowali, has been steadfast for us in many different ways. Um, and Lord Crisp, uh, who's a fellow traveler with us, or we're a fellow traveler with him, has helped us practically and through his strategic approach. Um, and I hadn't thought of it, but maybe we should mention Prince Charles as well, who's always been keen on health creation, has worked with um, uh, lots of organizations to take that idea forward. We have worked with our associates on the ground who are vital to delivery. And you, our members, are our teachers and our inspiration. You are the vision for the future. So coming of age ushered in our new era. Um, so it is right that Durka is taking over as chair. She is the right person at the right time for the right organization. I look forward to continuing on the board and supporting her to take the Alliance to new heights. So thank you everybody. I look forward to the rest of the day. So thank you to our board um, members, our directors um, and colleagues. Uh, you can see how lucky I am to have landed in such a wonderful organisation um, and with such a group of colleagues. Um, and it's just reiterating those messages then um, of the health and care system and all the challenges um, and real kind of history of what's gone, but also the beautiful opportunities that lie ahead, and especially through the work of us, all of us together as a collective with partners and others to really take the efforts for health creation to another level and unlock a better, brighter future for the health and care system, including social care, as Lynn so rightly pointed out, um, and the potential to transform the lives of so many. And that's just such a massive, humbling moment. Um, just to look back, but also now with you to start looking forwards. So we just wanted to give a little, a little window of opportunity for a discussion, um, just at this stage, in terms of a conversation, it says a conversation um, in terms of Q&A, but I think rather than about me, let's make this about all of us and just open it up to whatever it is that you'd want to share by way of reflections about what you've heard. Uh, that may be about myself as a chair, but it might be about all the wonderful work or just some thoughts. So shall we open the floor? Um, either if you pop your hand up, uh, do come onto the screen um, and, and say something or put it in the chat and we'll make sure that we try our best to answer. So any reflections or any thoughts, any questions? 
Um, and Neil, I know you've been looking at the chat as well, so I don't know if there's anything there. Not at, not at the moment, but it might maybe if people are a little bit shy in coming forward. I know Meron has got actually would like to share uh, just a slide, which is looking about how we're going with driving that systems change. So that it may be appropriate to just for Meron to talk to that because that may help stimulate some discussion and some thinking. If that's okay with you, Meron, that would be brilliant. That would be fine. Um, so hello everyone, and thank you uh, for coming today. My name is Meryn Simpson and I'm Chief Executive of the Health Creation Alliance. And um, this slide really is just to, to, to just remind you of last year's member meeting when we started the, this narrative about the Health Creation Alliance transforming systems from the ground up, because what we found is that our health creation frameworks are very, very powerful. Um, and people are starting to see that it can be a common currency, a common language, common framework for uh, reaching into lots of different places, different sectors, different programs, different levels of the system, and actually coalescing around this framework. And so it is proving to be um, a, a great sort of unifier, if you like, and possibility of actually getting this updraft from the ground up. And I'm gonna be speaking a bit later, well, not speaking so much as hopefully engaging with some of, uh, some of you about um, about how we can leverage that change together and get that uh, that that, that um, change from the bottom up, from the ground up. Um, but it'd be great if people put their videos on, and you can take that slide down now, uh, Neil, and um, and to sort of ask Dirka some questions. She's new. You, the floor is yours. You've come, I think, to uh, to hear, you know, a little bit, uh, not just to hear, but to sort of interact. So um, do ask Dirka some questions. That's the way we get the conversation going. Thank you. Hazel, you've got your phone down. Hello, nice to meet you. Sorry, hello everybody. Are you hearing me all right from sunny Cornwall? Um, yeah, hi Brian, hi everybody. Uh, just, just gorgeous. You know, I'm in my 75th year now and what Merrin and this whole team have achieved, um, I guess I'm in my third decade now of, of health creation and it's just a dream come true so I just want to say congratulations to you all welcome Dirka what a what a fabulous team and a place you've walked into as you just said um gosh what can I say it it's just fantastic really to think we're where we are now from where we started and Merrin and Brian and I will remember the bleakness and Peter and all those who started with us 10 well golly 20 years ago but certainly in the last 10 years and it just didn't seem possible did it any of us <laughs> we we just went through so many um Oh, just down so many cul-de-sacs. So it's wonderful. And I'd just like to say, welcome, Durka. And would you consider coming to see us at some time down in Cornwall, down in some of the sites across the country that we've got, like Stoke-on-Trent, Skegness, um, certainly down in Camborne in the southwest, because there's nothing like, and if all of you have been to places where health creation is active, no, it, you just know it's happening when it's happening, but you have to sense it and see it for yourself sometimes. So that's a challenge I'd like to throw throw out to you. Thank you. Um, thank you for, for your longevity with this. I mean, it, there's so much there. Uh, thank you for bringing uh, the sunny south as well. I can see that the sun coming in through the window is quite going to... Uh, well, not quite as glorious here in London. And yes, I would absolutely love that. So thank you for your invite. Um, I was just talking to colleagues about some, some work, and I know we're, we're gonna go, go through it, but some, some things that might be around the corner. Um, and saying exactly that, I would love to, to come along. So, so if there are opportunities, uh, just, just to meet you face to face, uh, but also come and see the great work you're doing. Absolutely. That's wonderful. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so can I, uh, if there aren't any other hands up, I guess, oh, or Brian. Um, I, I just wanted to, there's, there's some people in the chat that I'm quite interested in, and I was just wondering if they might want to say a little bit about 
them and why they are interested in coming here. So I, I, I'm just choosing one not quite at random because it sounds like she needs to leave earlier, but um, so it would be nice to hear from, but I was just wondering if Alison Dix would be interested in saying a little bit about you and why you're here. Hello, thank you. Can you hear me? Yeah, yeah. So, um, so yeah, I. It's completely new to me. I usually am a physiotherapist in secondary care, um, but I've been out of that for a year doing a Darcy fellowship at so it's through Southbank University. It's a postgraduate certificate in clinical leadership, and then you're hosted by an NHS trust to do some sort of change work. And um, I've led it up doing quite a bit about health inequalities and um, my supervisor has just opened up a whole new world to me. And he told me about the Health Creation Alliance. Health Creation Alliance. And so I've sort of been following on Twitter and then happened to see about this meeting this afternoon and thought, oh, here's an opportunity to hear more because it's I'm just thinking in a completely different way to how I always have on a very service delivery model, but just trying to think much more upstream. So it's a whole new world to me, which I'm feeling very passionate about and wanting to learn more from all of you. So thank you for having me. Lovely. Thank you. Um, and Meryn, I guess that the, the frameworks and things are really helpful in the clinical settings, aren't they, when, when we do work? So for colleagues like Alison, um, I guess the three C's model or the frameworks or just the principles, um, I know that you've had amazing feedback from some of the work already done. I don't know if you wanted to say a bit about that. So uh, just repeat that again. I was reading a text at the same time. I'm going to be on from Neil, actually. So yeah. anyway, carry on. No, I, I was just saying that kind of actually, so, so in terms of that notion of health creation, so I know as a, as a clinician, and I'm, I'm sure others from different walks, that traditional training is very ill health focused and very system focused, whereas actually there is a real transformational potential um, much needed um, in terms of the clinical mindset and Alison coming here today. Isn't that amazing that you've come, your supervisors told you, and, and you see it as an exciting possibility. And I was just thinking, Marilyn, in the work that we do, for example, with Surrey, uh, that framework has been really helpful, hasn't it? Um, yes, so, sorry about that. And yeah, uh, of course it has. Um, so what we're finding is that um, this kind of, we can apply health creation into all sorts of places. And uh, because because it's uh, very, you know, we've reduced it down to its very essence and it's kind of it, it, the, the language is 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 uh, is not particular to any particular sector or program. Um, and so what we but we're finding that there's kind of two blobs uh, in which it's very useful to uh, to to bring health creation in. One is the community blob. So how can you strengthen communities and you know, um, do, do things on the community side of things. But one is the clinical blob. And how, how can you, if you're faced with a national programme like Core 20 Plus 5, which has a lot of merits, but is still very clinically focused, how can we apply the, the framework into that place and enable um, organisations to sort of, you know, to, to connect, uh, to, to listen, to draw on community strengths and each other's strengths, and how can we uh, get that truth telling about the reality of the service and what it's actually achieving? And how can we persuade people to, to, to move on that? So we use the framework to actually gently challenge systems about where they're really at uh, and how good they really are. Let's say systems, let's say partnerships with groups of people. Um, and, um, and we've got a very nifty sort of a, a few different approaches to doing this, but one is, you know, a very, very nifty um, way of, of, of working a, a workshop um, with a group of people where we can get significant change just through a three hour period. So I guess um, that that clinical application to this is something that in the early days when we first started out seven years ago, eluded us a bit. We thought it wasn't possible, but now we're finding that it absolutely is possible because the, the, the framework is actually an organization and partnership development um, a, a framework as well so you can challenge organizations um, and and uh, yeah I don't know if you want to say any, anything in addition to that Neil about the, the clinical and um, kind of cohort application as well. 
No, no, I think that I think that um, summarises. But it is it, it is as well as on in terms of engaging with communities, we are using it increasingly around looking at how how people can better address some of their clinical priorities through um, working with their communities and identifying where the strengths are within the communities to support some of the clinical priorities, particularly in, for example, the areas of the core 20 plus five. Um, I think, for example, earlier diagnosis of cancer for some um, minority communities, et cetera. So yeah, it's, it's proving extremely useful. And actually, I'm gonna put Chris on the spot as well as Chris is, um, is an, it's quite an advocate for um, health creation and has been using the framework. So Chris, from someone who's actually using it on a bit of a day-to-day -day basis, it'd be great to hear from you. Yeah, thanks for that, Neil. Um, <laughs> yeah, I mean, the, 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 I think we've discussed it before, how health, what health creation has given me is almost a framework and a language. And the more of us that learn this language, and you guys are all fluent, but you know, some people have now got a smattering in halting. So it starts to enable me to explore concepts with people that perhaps wouldn't normally buy into them because they're so far removed from them. Um, but, but to put it in an even more flowery way, right? Because I'm not one for structure. I like organic things. And I like to think about our community as an ecosystem. And, you know, health creation is almost like giving us tools to make it fertile. It's, it's, and I, I'm literally getting flowery now, aren't I? Um, but I don't know, you've caught me on an odd day, you know, Neil? Like I've got an awful lot on, and my mind's all over the place. But, but I have really been pondering some of this stuff, like on quite a deep level. And I was trying to encourage members, I'll give you a real example. I'm trying to encourage members of the community to become core, core 20 plus five connectors. Right. And now I don't want to say to those people, the reason I've selected you is because you live in the poorest neighborhood. I grew up in the same neighborhood, so there's no judgments here. But, you know, you're being picked because you're in the poorest neighborhood and you've been through some trauma. And now academia and professionals would like to learn from that so we can do our job better. Right. If you actually try to do that without applying the principles of health creation, without looking, where's the reciprocity? Where's the truthful conversation? How am I building this person's capacity? Because if you don't, you can be the most well-meaning people in the world and you can literally come in and academically study poverty. So, so what the, the framework's given me is, but the resource comes in via academics at the moment, via universities who come along and say, Halton, we'd really like to work with one of your underserved, hard to reach communities. And then we've we've had a couple of examples recently, one where we, we just let them run loose. We told them which community to have a crack at and we let them run loose. And they've come back and said, we can't do it. The community's too right wing, it's too hard. People aren't what we expected. Can we, can we pick a better estate? Okay, so that's how health equalities happen, isn't it? Um, now, that hasn't happened on my Core 20 projects, as hard as they've been, because we're applying a framework of who's already in the neighbourhood, how do we create this organically, how do we pass the ownership over? And I'm not saying I've got this all right, but, you know, I've, I, we mentioned Core 20 and we mentioned health creation in the same breath before, and I suppose that's where the rubber meets the road for me. Mm. And ultimately, the way I'm selling it to people is, you can either tell your own story or you can let people not from here tell it for you. And what those people will do, and they're not doing it to be mean, they will revert to what they've been told in their institution. So they will say about our neighbourhood, we don't feed our children properly. We just give them sausage rolls. There's three generations of unemployment. What do you expect? Those people have no aspirations. That's the narrative that other people say about the place I love. So I would rather have a narrative that says, this is Kev, served for his country, absolute hero, came back, then he was a fireman. Now he's having a tough time, but he's still helping other veterans. That's a story from Halton, not just crime rates and teen pregnancy and whatever they want to focus on. So, right, I shall move my soapbox aside now, Neil. I'm not sure if that's what you wanted, but that's what I feel, and that's what you guys inspire from me, so. 
that's the beauty of uh, you know just that that organic as you've described I mean just look at the chat um there is so much support there's so many hearts and claps because it was just so beautifully put so I've just come off a call just before this with um the college of lived experience um and somebody who was studying tr um adverse life experiences and themselves had experienced the most horrific of experiences and their messages were pretty much exactly what you've said so so just beautifully put and thank you so much um I know that we're running over time but I spotted Jean's hand I, I hope I'm saying your name correctly shall we just give you a moment um you put it down but I don't, I don't know whether you wanted to come in uh, Jean I think with an e oh um, and I've got a direct message from you as well. Did you want to say what's in, in your message? Some of the headlines, go on. Or shall I, I'll read it. How about that? Let me read it. Go on. It might be a sound. Hello, okay. hello. can you hear me? Can you hear yeah, me? No, so, right. so sorry, so sorry. I, I thought my name is Jeanette, but it's just come, it's come up as Jean. Um, hi, and congratulations on all the fantastic work so far. Um, what we're doing down here in Gloucestershire is uh, beta testing a, an app, um, soon to be part of a platform, but she's encouraging healthy behaviours. Because I think to get real health creation, you have to get into the mind and it's kind of behaviour change. It's going down really well um, and really notice a massive change in behaviours just in a couple of weeks. So um, it's all the principles of health and well-being, obviously. Um, and we're trying to sort of see how, you know, monitor it. But um, my colleagues are in Europe that I'm, that I'm working with. So at the moment, we're at a very, very seed stage. Um, so I think the future, you know, is about getting people to take responsibility for their health and, the, you know, giving them the tools to do it. And um, so it's basically validating what you've all been saying. So, yeah. Sorry about the communication. No, that's all right. And thank you, Jeanette. Um, no, and, and I'm kind of getting a flavour for the national scale of the network, as well as the beautiful depth and experience in all the different sectors. So that's just wonderful. Um, Brian, I know you mentioned that there's somebody uh, from Wales with us as well. Um, and I know that there's a colleague of mine from a different, a different role as well here too. So um, I'm, I'm not going to delve into there, but if there's, I think hopefully there'll be lots of opportunities to keep talking. Uh, but Meryn, if it's okay, let's hand over to you to, to talk about levering, leveraging change. And then we'll hopefully come back um, and, and have a chat. Keep, keep going with all the, the threads and the ideas and the sharing. So Meryn. Thank you, Durka. And... Um, <clears throat> Yes, so if you, uh, if you just go to the next slide, this session is, I'm just gonna be saying a few words about how we are already leveraging change with several of our active members and give you a bit of a taster for that. For those of you who are not familiar with the Health Creation Alliance, maybe this is your first meeting, um, this is uh, who we are and our mission. So we're the leading national cross-sector movement. We're a, we're a movement, uh, which is very important, addressing health inequalities through health creation. Anyone can join. So we're a mix of professionals from many sectors, um, inside and outside the NHS, uh, people with lived experience of poverty, trauma and discrimination and community leaders. And all of, all of us are becoming better leaders uh, for health creation. So our mission is to increase the number of years people live in good health in every community, not just those that uh, we think are the, the, the right ones. And our ambition is to put health creation at the center of place-based health reforms at all levels so that it becomes bus business as usual. And uh, there's an equal focus to treating illness, prevention of ill health and creating health. So that's what our ambition is. It's a huge ambition, but we're making progress together. So if we put our, uh, go to the next slide, um, we are, by the way, updating our narratives, including that one. So if you have ideas about how you think we could describe what we do and about and how health creation works better. We are open for business, please get in touch. And we'll be exploring some of that in the breakouts as well. Um, but uh, we are in the process, we're just about to start reviewing our business plan. We've only, it's a three year business plan from 22 to 25, and we're just one year in, it's all going very well. 
uh, and we want to just review, do a one year review and take that further. So at the moment, these are our nine critical success factors, but you see continue and grow our connection with members is absolutely critical um, to our expansion, if you like. Um, uh, it's, a, it's all about collective agency, actually. It's more, more than growing the connection. It's about, it's about doing things together. How can we do things together that we couldn't otherwise do, that otherwise wouldn't be possible? Um, this is our USP. We've got, we've got a, a nearly 2,000 strong um, membership and many active members. So what's the alchemy that we can generate by bringing together stuff? and people and assets, that all the um, skills, uh, experience, connections, et cetera. What can we do? Um, and we need to think creatively about what that, what that amounts to and be, be uh, intelligent about that. But this is what energizes me in this space is to leverage change together. And if you go to the next slide, um, that's just us. Uh, our members come in all sorts of shapes and sizes. So different times we kind of segment in different ways. And that's what the blobs are on the left hand side. The, the smaller purple blobs on the right hand side are integrated care systems. Yeah, and I include local authorities in that and all the other local partners, by the way. Um, and, um, and of course, we, we do need to, you know, we can offer programs for them. The, the, the sort of purple blobs are the ones that get it a bit more. The, the other ones are the, the, the lilac ones and the ones that don't get it quite so much but actually as a as our you know chair and non-exec directors as our team exec team um and our members and ICSs and partners we're all trying to um you know develop that voice for change connecting to transform and um and leverage uh, ultimately advanced health creation um, and leveraging change together, and that's not meant to go upwards. Actually, that's we need to re revise this uh, this this uh, picture because that change is happening all over. Um, however, um, uh, the we are talking to some very senior leaders now, um, the very top of uh, DHSC, NHS England, and OHID, and um, they are saying that the existing model for the NHS is no longer working and that they want to start playing more consistently in this space. And they're talking to us about how they might do that. So um, the question they're asking is, what is the role of the NHS in all of this? So change will come, but it will come from the ground up, not from those people at the top. And by doing all sorts of things at all sorts of levels, uh, and not being precious about that, um, then you know, we can really have power together. We are doing devolution from the ground up. And that uses, you know, is a bit different. We're here about, this is about learning how to ask for things we need from the people who are above and around us and, uh, and, and offering the things that we think they need as well. Um, so if you go to the, the next slide, um, this is, uh, um, uh, we are already leveraging change in many ways with members and Hazel's here today. We've been doing this for what seems like forever uh, with C2, um, leveraging that change through action, through relationships, importantly. But I've got here six ideas for ways in which you could help us and we could help you to, to do that. Um, and, uh, but, and this is about creating new order. And those words came from Hazel, in fact. Uh, you know, um, working as a movement, you can create new order. And let's be creative about how we do that. So I'm going to go through each of these six very quickly to give you a, a sense of what's happening. And then hopefully we can have a conversation about what else you think we could do or how we might be able to do this. So one is around influencing. Influencing policy isn't the most important thing here at all. Uh, but nevertheless, we, you know, we do want to keep connected to those most senior people to help, help them to know how they can create the conditions for us to do more of this. Um, so it's all about, you know, not, not, it's all about taking, out, taking away the barriers actually to change. So the NHS, the one question here is how can we best leverage policy, policy change with our members? And you might want to start putting ideas in the chat about that. But actually a very specific possibility right now is NHS at 75. This is an invitation th through a blog from NHS Assembly. And we're, we're, the deadline's tomorrow. I'm going to be writing our response by then. But essentially, they're asking these three questions. And the most important one for me is how does the NHS best service in the future? We're future facing, we're solutions focused, positive, the possibility space, not the problem space, not looking backwards too much. 
Um, so what one thing would you like the NHS to do to embed health creation? Let's use this as a moment to gather that insight. And you can put that in the chat box and we'll be knitting it into our response. So there's a good example in the moment of how we can leverage change together. If you want to go to the, the next slide, um, this is about securing new contracts, actually. Um, we are already active in a number of places. We're building our associates so we can do more. Of course, this brings in money for us to do more of the, the stuff that we've traditionally done pro bono and that community benefit and to help with the movement side of things um, because it's very difficult to fund the movement. No one really understands how it works. Um, but, um, but if you can help us to win contracts, that would be fantastic. And we will be sending you after this, uh, if you put your email in the, in the chat, um, a, a, a menu of, of options that we've developed. And we've, we've been working in all of these. Oh, well, I'm not going to go through them, except to say, uh, we call it a discovery learning programme because we're all discovering all the time. Uh, and uh, it, within this list here, there are things you can buy for two thousand pounds, and then it goes up to two hundred thousand uh, pounds. And of course, you know, with the with the big version, that's that's whole system transformation we're talking about, and, and and you get a lot of little little elements there. So if you you're connected to integrated care systems, acute trusts, PCNs, and you sorry that should say PCNs there, um, and you think that they could use Health Creation Alliance. Uh, and work with us as partners to deliver this. That would be fantastic if you could help us to build that relationship because it's the trust that, that will secure the new contracts. Uh, another slide, um, Will is taking us into, this is just two, two uh, uh, contracts we're, we're currently delivering. Um, we, the first is a lived experience, um, well, we're calling it Roundhouse now, that came from the, 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 the seedling lived experience group that is doing this, but, um, I, I, one of our members, Lisa Holden, uh, we've been uh, working with for a, a number of years to build uh, this uh, network in, in North Yorkshire. And we recently secured this contract to do a scoping study um, on, um, on, uh, on how, to, how to build that lived experience parliament, actually, uh, that all the different organizations could come to and, and listen to. It's been an absolutely fascinating project, but Lisa, um, said to me that the three C's are life-saving. They've been life-saving for her. She's here today, actually, uh, and um, maybe she could, wants to say a few words about that. But um, uh, that that confidence to to connect and to, to network came through the relationship with the Health Creation Alliance. And through that network, we've actually now delivered a scoping study in North Yorkshire. And that we've built the consensus around how to take this forward. And we, we're starting to look at how we can reorient the thinking and action across multiple organizations there so that they understand what needs to change and how they can get behind the roundhouse. And Lisa, I don't know what, if you want to come in there just for 30 seconds to, to give some extra um, background to that. Or possibly not. <laughs> so. Um, if you do want to, then uh, let me know. Um, but um, uh, the, the other example is in Surrey, uh, and we're doing this is where we're doing a very large project, and we are actually working with our client as a partner. Um, you know, it's not a transactional relationship at all because local leadership is critical to to getting this right. Uh, it's a winning formula of Health Creation Alliance and local leadership. And if you just go to the next slide, I'll just there's a few quotes here from. Our client, Daniel Sherlock, um, who um, basically, uh, there we are, there we are. So working as a partner is the only way with Health Creation Alliance is the only way we'll make this shift happen. Um, it's been hard work. Well, you can't just land, you can't just ask the front line to do it. You need to change the conditions in the system. That, and that means messaging back to the system. And it is hard work, but we've made some system shifts together that wouldn't have done if Health Creation Alliance had just come in and done that consultancy piece. So this is about opening new possibilities by working together. Um, thank you. So if you go to the next slide, um, another way that we're, we're already leveraging change with our members is through uh, funding and, and funding partners. Now, the partners here listed all helped us to put on Health Creation Coming of Age, and that series of sessions would not have been possible without them. And we're very grateful to our funders, but they have offered so much more than just the funding. They helped us to design the sessions and they contributed fantastically. 
And, you know, it was a really exciting time. So we're not just interested in your money, we're interested in you as well. Um, and uh, if you can sort of help to connect us to contributors and fund us for future programmes, that's brilliant. Uh, but also not, not forgetting that with this piece of work we did and published uh, in October last year with NHS Property Services, Creating Spaces, um, ten, we, we found 10 anchor, what we call the anchor organisations, through our members who, well, who are our members, who helped connect us to groups of people who are often very seldom heard. And that trust came through our members. And we were able to do focus groups with 10 different communities, including uh, carers, people with a learning disability, um, people, uh, gypsy Roma traveler community, um, and many, many more. Um, uh, and, and we could uh, sort of uh, hear from them and their experiences and we we handled that the way we handled that was in in a way you know health creating way with the reciprocity built in etc and we built trust with those groups so we were able to en enable their voice to get through to many many people through uh, nhs property services i know were thought that that was um a, it was a real surprise to them the you know the, the depth of of insight that we were able to deliver and that has now gone gone much wider so we're very excited that you know through building these trusting relationships we can get that voice out in in the right way and bring that to the wider world um and then on our next slide we have uh, increasing numbers of associates and uh, if you can help us to identify excellent associates that we can work with um, we've got uh, karen gary there Sonal, Sonal Mehta, um, Joe McGrail, Samira Ben Omar, who's joining um, very soon, and uh, and Bill Graham. Uh, but we've got we'd love to hear from you if you can um, find us more to work with uh, who can help us deliver on some of this. Um, and and also our associates. Actually, we work with them to leverage change together as well. So this isn't a traditional relationship. We're always building those relationships out. So and then finally, uh, number six is that um, with through coming of age, we gained um, uh, more than a dozen calls to action, and we want help to shape those into something really powerful. We are already using them, by the way. But what we want to do is hold a, an event in two and a half weeks' time, a lunchtime Zoom session. You're all invited to that. It's free to attend. And we'll be uh, talking a little bit more about the course, not, not talking very much about them actually, but helping to put some meat on the bones and work out how best to put those out to our members so we can start to um, do, do that, you know, calls to action for integrated care systems to adopt and embed health creation. Uh, so do join us there. And just the final slide um, is just to give you a, a, a bit of a flavor of what some of those calls to actions are. So making health creation explicit in NHS narratives. Currently, I don't see it anywhere, although people are doing it behind the scenes. Um, for example, invest 2% um, of your NHS budget to support health creation activity. There are one or two ICSs that are looking at this, one or 2%. And, um, uh, and you know, reverse establish reverse mentoring where community members and place or systems leaders you know, are, are, are in a mentoring uh, relationship but it's the community members that are mentoring the system leaders. That's uh, the important part here. Um, protected time clinicians, always a problem, and there, there are some solutions, hopefully, um, and support workforces to respond to the reality of communities' lives um, as, they, as, they, as, they, you know, as those communities are experiencing them. Lots of, we've got many more calls to action, so please come along on uh, 13th of June and help us to shape those and start to really get them out there. Um, and uh, and I think that that's probably my last slide, although go to the next slide just in case. And just to say, if if these seem too hard, you know, if it's too much of a demand on you, if you're busy and you can't do any of these, you know, there's lots of other things that you, you could do to work with us to help leverage change, like retweet our tweets, for example, on a regular basis. That would be fantastic. You know, simple things, small things that can make a big difference. It, they're the Trojan mice that we need to start to you know, work with much more, the small things that make a big difference. And you can do some of, of, of those things as well. And maybe you know, just talk to one of your colleagues about joining the Health Creation Alliance, like Alison was introduced through, through someone else. So um, your ideas in the chat would be much appreciated. And I look forward to seeing many more of you um, over, you know, over the coming weeks. Thank you. Thank you, Merrin. And echoing words of colleagues also, I mean, 
all of that that you've gone through. Um, I mean, it's just thank you for being such a wonderful chief exec for the organization, real powerhouse driving a lot of that work and the ideas. Uh, so just, just from me, thank you, but to echo what colleagues have said. Um, so you, the question you posed about the NHS at 75, there are some really helpful comments. Um, and then it's just to move us on uh, to our guest as well. But uh, I, I hope you've got enough in the chat um, by way of just feeding in some stuff from, from tomorrow. So, so I think Chris has uh, given us something, Anne has given something. Uh, Gemma, thank you for the lovely comment. Uh, and Lynn as well, kind of your thoughts. And I've got something as a direct message from Jeanette, but if you wanted to put it in the main, I think that would be helpful for the return as well. So any more thoughts about what we should be saying back in our return uh, to, to NHS England about that real opportunity at 75 um, to do things differently? And I think we'll make the point again about social care um, and not forgetting its twin. I, I had the image of two twins born at the same time and one very different to the other. So there's all of that. Um, but for now, um, really... Um, Moving us on, uh, but do use the chat if you've got thoughts and, and keep putting these in there. But to Professor Rochelle Burgess. So, um, Rochelle, I don't know if you're, you're here um, with us. Yes, you are. Brilliant. Hello. Thank you for joining us. Thank you. Uh, so, uh, real honour and a delight to have you with us uh, to talk about the power of collective agency. Uh, so just for colleagues who don't know you, so uh, Professor Rochelle Burgess is the Associate Professor in Global Health and Deputy Director of the UCL Centre for Global Non-Communicable Diseases. So thank you very much for joining us today. Um, thank you. And I think we're going to do it as a bit of a and a I think that's what we said. Uh, yeah. yeah. Doing a bit of a chat. I... I uh... I am a person who believes quite strongly in the fact that community is creation, which I think is why Marin, Marin has tracked me down because that's very much what, what you guys are up to in your sort of in, in amazing, in your amazing work. And keynotes are not, you know, a collective thing. They're a didactic one person talking very little chance for dialogue. So um, I did, I much prefer this idea of sort of reflecting on questions and talking and, and having people contribute all the way through, and and I do apologize that I will will have to leave um, after after the chat, as I have another event to to move on to. So I'm I'm very sorry, but hopefully this won't be the only time that we connect because what you're doing is is really amazing. Thank you, um, and that that is Marin, isn't it? Find find the right people, great people, and kind of you know help help make those connections. I think that's part of the whole social movement mentality. Um, so thank you. Um, can I start with a question that we, we posed colleagues um, actually who, who put things in the chat? Uh, so, so really from, from that lens of kind of, you know, all the experience you bring, um, what would you say to the NHS at 75? I know we've got some questions, but, but there's just that one. And also to say if anyone's got questions, well, please, we're going to make this interactive. So put the questions in the chat, raise your hand. We're going to make this a proper conversation between all of us, if we can. But yeah, what would you say? Oh, God. Um, <laughs> what wouldn't I say to the NHS? I've been trying to say stuff to them since, since I'm, I moved here many, many years ago. Um, they've not listened yet. Um, I guess I guess for me, one of the the main things that I would say is that the I think the way in which we think about how things like social and structural determinants relate to health systems is is limiting and that becomes for the practitioners I know sort of the the biggest not necessarily barrier but the thing that sort of um leaves them with the heaviest feeling so an acknowledgement and an understanding of of the fact that health outcomes are socially determined, but they don't feel that they have the tools or the skills in order to meaningfully respond to that, that dimension of people's lives beyond a referral or beyond it. And, and I, I really feel like what health creation does is it sort of 
shifts the language and, and the way that we talk about health from something of a deficit model to more of possibilities and strengths-based and strengths-oriented models, which then opens up a whole other sort of sets of pathways for practitioners to feel that they can go down, I feel like, in terms of engaging with communities and citizens in different ways. Um, so I guess for me, the thing I would say to the NHS is, you know, the NHS was born out of a desire to create equity where there was none. And that is its core. That was its core foundational creation. And what equity looks like and the work you have to do to achieve that now requires a different vision. And so we really need to be looking at and influencing models that allow us to recognize and act on that vision, which is really around, I guess, social and, and dare I say, political change. Because somebody in the chat has said there is no pill for poverty, and that's, <laughs> that's exactly it. So how do you get practitioners to sort of realize that the things that address poverty, address inequity, our treatment, like treatment is transformation. The best kind of treatment is transformation of social worlds. And it is everybody's responsibility to contribute to that process. It should be in everybody's work plan to contribute to that process. Your work plan does not stop with the administration of a pill. You know, I work largely in the mental health landscape and there's this tension around sort of, you know, you give a, when people's depression, I work largely around common mental disorders and if people's depression is socio-structurally and politically determined, the pill is insufficient. It might be necessary, but it will always be insufficient. And I think the sooner we can get health systems to recognize this and become more interested in the ways in which a health system can also contribute to structural and societal change and seeing that as its responsibility, the better off we are. And so, yeah, I think I'll, I'll I think I'll stop there because I I'm, I could ramble some more, but I, but I, um, I'll stop and let people respond a bit. And it's it's so true, and and Chris beautifully put. Uh, so so Jeanette's basically said it's it's about mindset change. Um, yeah, mindset change has begun, and people like Alison joining today actually it's it's, it's kind of sparking more and more. Um, people going actually this fundamentally needs changing so thank you um we've got a question from lynn uh so so lynn i don't know if you want to come in and ask your question um but otherwise yes yeah, come on let's get you in time. that's very kind uh, professor burgess thank you it was um i loved your reference to collective agency and it's how do we catalyze that amongst the peoples that are feeling pretty hopeless right now. Yeah, I think I think that's a that's a huge thing. Um, one of the the places where I learned the most about working through through hopelessness um, is in my work uh, with sort of black African black Caribbean communities and and scholarship from black um uh people from the US um and i think there's this um there's this sort of understanding and orientation towards joy so sometimes they talk about sort of black joy or mechanisms through which people make joy manifest in their lives despite the existence of all of these sort of structural violences inequalities people know they are there Despite that, we still go through and make joy, sometimes in ways that we don't recognize as being that meaningful or that important to processes of social change. And, and I guess in, in thinking about how we might we elevate that to scale, um, I, I do a lot of thinking around um, celebrating survival. So there's an, an intervention model that I've worked with in South Africa for 
Um, we we originally it was created by um, a, a narrative therapist um, to work with men and women around restoring their lives, and so a process of sort of reimagining what is easily seen as failures as also survival. So the fact that we are still here means that we must be doing something right. And so how do we start with survival? How do we start with the identifying and the labeling of sort of, of strengths, the internal capacities that people use every day to sustain themselves in the face of sometimes unimaginable contexts um, as a starting point for planning interventions. And, and I think that that is very much at the core of, of what, you know, health creation is, is looking at, you know, creating an opportunity to change the a language. I think it was, it was Chris possibly earlier who was talking about finally having this language. And, and the biggest thing about it is the shift away from a deficit language or a deficit model to actually say, we, you don't go into a community and say, this is what's wrong with you. How would anybody react? I, this term of like hard to reach makes me loony, <laughs> for lack of a better word. I'm thinking about the Looney Tunes cartoons when I was growing up and you just sort of have like the character's eyes just sort of pop out of their, their heads. <laughs> so that's what I mean in that sense. When I hear the phrase hard to reach, there's so much embodied in that, which is usually sort of histories of oppression, um, systemic violence driven by systems who don't recognize people who have um, silenced them or excluded them in particular ways. And they're hard to reach because they do not trust these systems anymore. And they have every right not to trust these systems anymore. Yes, I'm a big um, junkie of trauma-informed and compassionate language, Dina. I'm glad that you heard that. That means my my attempts to, to be that way are working. Um, so essentially what this, this means to me is when you have a group that's hard to reach, you need to have a completely different language that is more celebratory of the fact that these groups are still here. They are still here despite everything. And how does you, can you turn that on its head to say, let us recreate and rebuild models from your strengths, from your knowledge of the world you live in to change the circumstances that make you unhealthy. And so that's, I feel, where hope sort of comes from because um, sometimes, I mean, the women in that intervention in South Africa talked about the biggest thing that happened to them is they felt they had hope, not just because they, you know, in the vent intervention, we did sort of activities after we therapeutic activities, we did sort of practical activities around planning and action planning and training around development issues in their lives. So sort of community sort of asset based kind of development stuff. And they said not only were they helped by the fact that they could see a future for themselves, but they felt and saw value in themselves. And so if you sort of need those two things to happen together. You need to change the types of languages that people use about communities from the outside. So that's why it's so important that this sort of framework of health creation gets sort of spread throughout the NHS because it's a much better way of approaching community engagement and it's historically excluded communities but it also creates an opportunity for changing the language that people use to talk about themselves, to talk about their own histories, to become more aware of the small wins in their lives, I think. Yeah, um, which is something that has helped me even to be um, an, a researcher and an activist in the spaces that I have been, in the body that I occupy. It's very, it can be very heavy sometimes. And you're sort of thinking about and fighting against quite heavy, long standing challenges. And it's only through these small wins that you're able to persist. So, yeah. Wow. Just wow. 
just, thank just incredible. Thank you. And thank you for your question, Lynn. Um, Tina, I was going to bring you in, if that's all right, because you've got a question about language, don't you? You want this embedded across health and care, fundamentally. Do you want to say a bit more? Yeah, I'll put my camera on as well. <laughs> yeah. I'm on my phone, so uh, yeah. Uh, you're not in the yeah. it looks like you're in the forest you know we're trying <laughs> no, to I just like sort it. of hope you were out in the woods in nature <laughs> yeah yeah no I, I just think that until we get the language embedded across all systems not just health and social care but absolutely all systems um it can make such a huge difference um I'm, I'm going through some stuff at the moment I, I, my experience is lived experience domestic abuse and childhood sexual assault and I'd like to say a big thank you to Health Creation Alliance for letting us take our exhibition of childhood sexual assault survivors to the House of Lords because that was just an amazing experience but um, I'm needing and reaching out for help finding lots of gaps in systems but the way somebody speaks to me can actually make such a huge difference. And I've had two very different experiences recently. I, I was at a hand clinic the other day and the lady, she's so lovely and she looked me in the face and she just reassured me that what I'm going through is not, is well, pretty terrible, she said, but you are managing and you are doing great. And she just connected and it's that connection. And I was just speaking to my friend, um, who came to the health creation with me um, uh, at the House of Lords. And she's doing some work with Essex University in, um, interviewing. And she was having that same conversation with one of the candidates, seemed on the surface very capable, but there was just that connection missing. So, and, and you make that connection through body language, but also the language you're using. So yeah, um, I'd just love to see more being done there's there's too much in the systems of mo at the moment of doing a quick webinar on what trauma informed is and ticking the box mm, that we need to actually really embedded so i guess the question is how how do we actually get the language and the understanding in the way that you've articulated it so beautifully to really just permeate through the health and care system um that's a good question. Um, I'll, I'll answer it. And then I see that um, Brian's hand is up. So then I'll, um, if, if that hand is up for like a, a current hand, Brian, then I would love to hear from you. Um, I guess, I guess for me, one of the, it sort of has to come in two directions. So it has to be sort of calls from bottom up systems, sort of demanding different ways of in, engagement. And, and I guess that's why NHS England could do something like that from the top down because of their sort of cross-cutting, um, their cross-cutting engagement across sort of all of the NHS and, and relationships to other sectors. Um, a big thing will be in training. So if you get, if you're somehow able to get this type of engagement into curriculums and shifting curriculums and how health practitioners across all different cadres, different specialties are trained, um, where the, the focus is on identification of assets. Um, and I think another thing that is really important to that and sort of celebration of, of strengths is also, um, also making sure that we, Oh gosh, it's just left my head. Also making sure that we are able to what was I saying? Uh, so assets, strengths, hold complexity. There it is. And um I think that this is really a fight against the specializations that exist within healthcare um, and the hierarchies in power that exist within those specializations. Yeah. And you can see that in the way different cadres are paid for their work and different staff are sort of valued within the health, within health systems. 
Um, and you can also see that in the struggles that we see within multidisciplinary work and interdisciplinary work in health, that even if you are bringing in multiple like visions or perspectives of the problem, including like lived experience, there remains a hierarchy in what those different voices are serving. Mm. So they're there to serve the goal of the reduction of health symptoms, right? Um, and so the, at most the biomedical knowledge becomes prioritized. And I think, so a part of trying to get to a place where we are including and including a different type of language and people meaningfully including it is that we have to sort of challenge people to become aware of the hierarchies that exist within, within the system and whose voice counts most and, and where it counts most and really try to hold the complexity around people's issues. And so a bit of that is around person-centered care, but it, it's really about centering us, the person's project, even if their project is more social than it is biological mm. and still seeing the fact that you have a role in that process, mm. still seeing the importance of, of biomedicine within that process. Thank you. And, and as you were talking, it reminded me of that, that risk of oversimplification. Mm. Um, so, so the tendency in health and care to want to simplify down too quickly, when actually there's something about the stories, a bit like Chris was saying earlier, actually so beautifully, and then the nuances and the individual actually holding that their own. Um, Loreen, um, I'm just wondering if, if you'd want to come in and say a little bit of what you've said um, in the chat. Um, Chris, um, I don't, so we're running out of time as well. No, no, you've got another meeting, don't you? And then Brian, I think there was a question as well. You had your hand up. So, so probably we've got time for those. Yeah, that's fine. Is that okay? Thank you. So Lorene. Um, yes, hi. Uh, sorry, apologies. I'm in, I'm in the office and there are other people here. So apologies for the background noise. Um, I think you've really answered the question around stories, narratives and language. Um, and the challenge of how do you work with systems to first recognize the importance of language and how language creates narratives, which then create that world, that social world we live in, and how then people align with those narratives. And if they are deficit narratives, then they go to that self-fulfilling prophecy, they then reinforce that. So I think it's very, very important. I think for me, that's always the challenge. And not only in terms of how systems create those stories and narratives, it's also thinking as Dirk was talking, I was reflecting on how we, we also create narratives about the systems mm. um, and use language that also maybe creates these sometimes monsters, these big mountains that we can't overcome as if systems exist unto themselves and that systems are created by people or constitutive mm -hmm. of people and processes and those structures. So I think there's something there to reflect. And I think for me, that's also another question that it goes both ways. So mm -hmm. be mindful that we also as services users, patients, communities, also construct narratives that may also create those barriers. Thank you. And can we just get uh, the point from Brian as well, because uh, I had your hand up and I'm going to hand back to you, Rochelle, to kind of Wrap, wrap up or kind of well, as long as you can I mean we, we'd happily have you for as long as you give us uh, but I know you've got a commitment so Brian should we hear your point as well and then go back to our show I saw that Chris's hand was up so if if he wants to speak rather than me that's absolutely fine but he went down again so I don't know if he does want to speak let's, we can have both let's have both I'll that stay for an amazing. extra do you, know, do you know what? My, mine wasn't a biggie it was just something really resonated with me as you said it Rochelle so just the whole thing around narratives, and I'm a big believer in the stories we tell ourselves are what we become, essentially. And so some of what we're doing is about trying to give people the opportunity to tell the hero's tale. You know, the ancient tale that goes back to every ancient culture you can think of as the story of how a person goes to the depths, goes through adversity, 
overcomes it, comes back and is more powerful. And it can be Superman or Luke Skywalker in my day. Or it, But equally, it's the veteran I mentioned before. It's going through the adversity, coming through it. And you mentioned survival and the power that comes from survival. And it just resonated with me with that hero's journey. So I got excited, put my hand up, then thought better of it, put it back down. No, that was really good. Thank you for sharing that. Um, Brian, let's get your point as well. Sure. Thank you very much. So um, thank you very much, Rochelle, for what you've been saying. And I listened to your BBC podcast, which is very inspiring as well. And people should have a listen to that. It's on BBC Sounds. Um, I'm a GP and um, for ages, I I see people um, when I did GPing more frequently, I would know a fair amount about them. I would perhaps have visited them at home. I might know their family members and so on. Um, but when they came to me with a problem or with distress, it's absolutely clear that, you know, it is their social determinants of health that makes that really determines their future health. And I, as a GP, even if I understand that in vague terms and know a little bit about them, I have no handle on that really at all. And when we set up a, a health project in my practice a long time ago, and we really were using health creating approaches that, um, worked with local communities to understand the issues that mattered to them, we were actually able to change services. We were able to make the roads safer. We made a difference to housing. We made a difference to uh, a whole range of issues because we had um, community power to some limit in some limited way. Um, we, we had that, we had that impact. And I think you're, your podcast is very strong on the idea of community action and mm -hmm. uh, community agency. Um, and uh, w w so there are two questions in, in that, really. We, if, if that's the direction of travel, that's kind of what Health Creation Alliance is looking for. Um, uh, apart from the issue of language, there are also practical things that might be done to make that more likely. One is... Um, a sort of community development approach, uh, mm -hmm. community strengthening, community asset building. Um, but the other question is, and I just wonder what you thought about that, but the other question is, even when a system like the NHS understands or knows what a community, what the issues are that matters to a community, they may not really be interested in responding to it. Um, the, the NHS and the statutory service are not very good at sharing power and they don't really want to share power particularly. It's a bit inconvenient mm. and complex um, when it's a lot easier just to treat with a pill. Um, so how do, <laughs> do you have any thoughts about how we might support, encourage, cajole, change the statutory sector to be more responsive to the kind of community messages and language that might come out from things like community development? So um, a long question. Long I've got a comment also from Dan Hopwell. So hi, hi Dan, um, from Bromley by Bo. Um, but about kind of, does the, does the NHS even do communities? Uh, so much, I think you've just opened so many doors and you're not gonna be able to answer all of those, I know. Uh, so maybe just pick out the things that, that you kind of do wanna to respond to just by way of landing the, this part. Yeah. So the thing that, that strikes me about the NHS is it seems to be very rigid and yet flexible enough for people to sort of like take concepts and reinterpret them to open space, right? And I, and I think that that is a little bit what you guys are doing when you're saying, okay, let's look at the, the core 20 plus five thing and let's how do you sort of reinterpret that or, or rework that in order to, to make that goal fit? Um, in terms of language and, and, and trying to get statutory, but that that's one off. So those things exist, but they then depend very much on sort of individual actors with the capacity and resources and the ability to do that and a space to do that. 
sort of reinterpreting of their systems and and re-leveraging it for more community-led purposes okay because i think that there's probably enough policy language and space within there that you could meander and use it um you know you can reinterpret and take over a discourse i would say but the thing that will probably get the most leverage um which is always a bit difficult for me to admit as a <laughs> as a qualitative sort of like researcher and an activist oriented in human stories is that they, they want sort of like modeling and costs. So in Colombia, where we have done this community led action, which I, I talk about in the podcast, a critical part of that work of that pilot was financing um, economic cost-effective analyses, which compared that process that we did where communities led sort of change in their communities to, and did sort of a comparison to, you know, business as usual um, or other types of interventions that the health system run. So it becomes much, it's very clearly in the Colombian context, much more cost-effective to facilitate community-led development and action around social determinants where people become aware of their rights where they act and drive action around their rights in their everyday lives which then becomes an active part of prevention it's a, it's more cost effective for the nhs and the health system to pay for that than it is to just leave it so you and and it, it, and in that is sort of the dialogue that we're starting to get traction with like a very interesting thing like oh wow okay that is a lot cheaper like than even the cheap stuff that we're doing cost effective let's use the fancy words um so i think that if i brought it back to language it's it is sort of what is the main language that is a trigger for action in the system if it's an economic justification, a language of economic justifications, then how do we show the value of our work also in that language? And I think that's how you sort of move from a space where we're leveraging individual action and resources at different levels of, of a system to wider system change. Like you sort of need both of them to go together. Um, and and in terms of the mental health landscape, I would just uh, encourage you to to look at the work of the Wandsworth Community Empowerment Network. Um, I have had the privilege of working with them for many years, and their sort of co-production model, which has involved very close engagement with um, the mental health trust in Wandsworth, has been very successful at sort of moving from leveraging individual action and relationships across the system to sort of mobilizing a slightly different language that allowed them to release a different set and pocket of resources to fund more community-led action around mental health improvements. So I think it's definitely possible. Uh, I think you guys are the people to do it. Uh, and I just, I really, I'm, I just feel very honored that you asked me to come and talk and really look forward to hopefully engaging more in the future because what is you're trying to happen here uh, is, is what needs to happen. Like I'm, I don't want people to talk about social prescribing. I want them to talk about this. So let's just talk about this. <laughs> thank you. And, and yes, absolutely. We would like to stay in touch. Um, thank you for coming today and uh, endorsing exactly as Brian said your your podcast which is amazing thank you for Marin to um, making that connection see you again soon I know you need to leave for your 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 next commitment and thank you for staying a bit extra no um, thanks very so much everyone Fine. And in true me style, I'm going to hand over to someone else to kind of give some of the headlines. So, Lorraine, I'm going to invite you yes. in. Probably just talk about two of the top points from our group. Yeah, so two points. Uh, we talked about 
of its language and use of language. And what was interesting is someone pointed out around even saying structural inequalities. What does that mean if we're just talking to people generally? and trying to get their views and experiences. So we also have to be mindful about that. And just examples of where language was used was changed, which had, which had a significant impact on how people worked together, connected uh, together. So it was the word shadowing in social care to observation, things like that. I think an important point that was raised that does create inequalities was around lack of transparency. So it's about being transparent or the lack of transparency within organizations where people then who have lived ex experience of a service cannot participate, cannot get their voices heard because they don't know where to go, who to speak to or what's going on. And I guess the last point was to uh, point out the disconnection between the strategic and the operational, where, you know, top down approaches with then fragment services, organizations, and you've got frontline people who work with communities, um, having experience and knowing what people need that's not necessarily shared at the top. Thank you. Marin. Oh, no, so it was Donna, wasn't it? No, Donna and then Marin, yeah. Thank you. I'm going to remember that technique for next time because it's really difficult to chair and to try and uh, remember that feedback. So I think we had a really rich discussion. I think there's I'll just pull out three, three things, really. I think that the first point was we kind of felt. So the question we were looking at is how does the health creation help address key NHS challenges? Um, I think the first thing was to say that there still is quite a clash of culture. We often talk about the same thing, but we're using different language and therefore have a different response to that. So um, an illness focused lens and a deconstruction and a, a kind of medical lens, it creates a certain avenue that you go down. Um, I think in terms of criticality of building relationships. Um, so I think there was a lot of positiveness about the PCN being a kind of a good um, sizable level of which to develop meaningful relationships. Um, that can bring the, this practice of collaboration, but that also needs to be about blurring boundaries um, in terms of in terms of what may be done in communities and in health centres and thinking about health communities greater than just um, in, in terms of uh, health centres. Um, invariably, we talked about money and how that we need to spend more money in this space, but actually it's not just about direct money, it's also thinking about the social and economic power of, of larger uh, NHS organisations. And just, just a, a final point that Alice raised is, we can as get into individual blame that it's an individual's fault that they're where they are, and that some of that goes back to the way we educate some of our clinicians, and that actually whether or not how much of this are we talking at undergrad, um, training um, in terms of so that it becomes more of part of how we create the net the, the generation of, of workforce does anyone else in my group want to check in if I missed anything Phew. <laughs> and you've got a thumbs up um, and I know that the detailed notes from those rich discussions we will take back and we'll use as well to shape our thinking but Maren let's let's hand over to you then for the announcements sure thank you so just uh, before you go just so you know some other things that are coming up incidentally we you know we, we will be having more after the summer but this is really up until then so do I mentioned the shaping the calls to action um, uh, lunchtime session that we'll be holding on the 13th of June. Neil will send a link out if you'd like to do that and it will come through the, the usual channels as well. Um, we are doing another coming of age session uh, on the 6th of July with, um, with Rethink Mental Illness. It's, it's called Shifting the Dial, Health Creating Approaches to Mental Ill Health. And this was one that we postponed from October because we didn't have the right partner on board and we thought it was too important to uh, get it wrong. So we delayed it instead. And so, um, but we will be bringing that to you on the 6th of July. So do attend if you'd like to. Um, a couple of, um, of, of national um, conferences that uh, I'll be speaking at um, in the next couple of months. One is NHS Expo on the 15th of June and also a King's Fund conference, the Community Led Approaches. Uh, conference. And then we're actually doing a lot of work around our narratives, both about what Health Creation Alliance does and uh, who we are. And But also, really importantly, and what we've been exploring today, 
is, um, is about how we explain to people simply and in a way that will you know, make their eyes open and uh, ears perk up, um, how we explain what health creation can do if you adopt and embed this approach, what it can do relating to structural inequality, relating to the wider determinants of health, um, relating to you know, how the NHS might buy into it because it will support uh, the, the necessary changes there. So this is complex work. Um, uh, uh, you know, language is so important and, and we probably, you know, I'm sure we won't get it right straight off, but we need uh, the uh, sort of insight from all our members on, on that to help shape those. So we're going to be doing that over the next few months. And um, please do uh, remember we have discovery learning programs that we um, are uh, leveraging change together with our with our clients. So please, um, Neil will be putting the uh, the, the menu of, of uh, options around. And we we're always good at inventing new options. So bespoke possibility is is a distinct possibility there. So I'll leave it there. And uh, thank you all for being here today. It's been absolutely great to hear such rich conversations and I've enjoyed them immensely. Thank you. Thank you. Um, echoing exactly that. So thank you so much. What brilliant colleagues joining us today and those who couldn't as well, who are gonna watch this. Um, just to say thank you for your work. Thank you for your support. Keep guiding us, keep shaping the work. Um, and I look forward to seeing you again soon. Thanks to the team. Um, Take care and, and we can do this, but let's keep going and see you again soon. Bye. Bye-bye.